was indeed a pleasure to collaborate with the staff of the Beinecke Library in studying the, uh, the world map by Enriquez Martellus uh, that Yale is so fortunate to, to possess. So we'll jump right in. Uh, here is the map. Um, as you can see from uh, in the text below, it's, it's very large. It's about four by six and a half feet. So it was a map designed to be displayed on a wall. Uh, the map uh, surfaced in Bern, Switzerland in the late 1950s. There was a flurry of interest in it. Uh, there were two articles about the map written by important historians of cartography, which for reasons I've never understood were never published, uh, but they acknowledged the importance and authenticity of the map. Um, and then the map was sold and anonymously purchased and anonymously donated to the Beinecke Library. And uh, there it has resided ever since, since the early 1960s. And I think it's fair to say that over those, over those recent decades, uh, not all that much work has been done on the map. And the reason for that is that most of the text on the map had faded to illegibility. It was an almost unstudiable object. Um, but let's jump in and, and learn more about this wonderful, very engaging map. So uh, why is this an important map? We'll begin with that question. I would suggest that there are three reasons that the map is particularly important. The first, is that it's very likely that this cartography influenced Christopher Columbus's thinking about the shape of Asia and in particular, the location of Japan. That's a bold statement. Um, and what evidence do we have to support that? Well, first I wanna say that I'm not trying to suggest that this physical map was in Christopher Columbus's hands. It's very likely that Martellus made other maps similar to this one. So this cartography influenced Columbus. There are several pieces of evidence that the map influenced Columbus's thinking, but I'm just gonna mention one of them that's uh, easy to convey briefly. Um, we see on the map, the island of Japan at the map's Eastern edge. And if you take into account the map's projection, the island's axis runs north and south, runs north to south. And uh, Columbus, uh, Columbus's son in his biography of his father said that his father would certainly have discovered Japan had he not believed that the axis of the island ran north to south. At this time, the only information about Japan that was available in Europe was through the writings of Marco Polo. Marco Polo doesn't say that the, uh, the axis of the island runs north to south. There are no other maps from this period uh, before Martellus's uh, that assign that orientation to the island. Uh, only Martellus's maps do. So on that basis, we can be quite confident uh, that this cartography influenced Columbus's thinking about Asia. And as I said, there are other pieces um, of evidence to support that claim as well, but we just don't have time to go through all of them. Second, Martellus's cartography influenced Martin Beheim in the creation of his terrestrial globe of 1492, which we see here. This is the earliest surviving terrestrial globe. Uh, we know that terrestrial globes were made earlier than this one. And in fact, there are classical texts that talk about terrestrial globes, but this happens to be the earliest one that survives. And we can see evidence of Martellus's influence on Beheim if we look at Southeast Asia, which we see here. Now, the, the left-hand part of this image comes from Ptolemy's geography, but the right-hand part comes from Marco Polo. Marco Polo does not give latitudes and longitudes for the locations he talks about. He says, this city is a 15-day journey from that city. So making a map based on Marco Polo's information involves a very large amount of extrapolation and guesswork. And so it's very, very unlikely that two people would uh, make maps 
based on Marco Polo that are this similar if one had not influenced the other. And we can see that influence even more clearly in Eastern Asia, where on both Martellus's map on the left and Beheim's globe on the right, in East Asia, we have a striking triangular peninsula uh, that juts eastward. And in both cases, it's just above uh, the tropic. So the location is very similar and the shape is very similar. And again, uh, the only source of information uh, that these cartographers were using uh, was Marco Polo. And it's very, very unlikely that two cartographers would make a map based on Marco Polo, uh, would, would make maps based on Marco Polo so similarly if one had not influenced the other. The third reason the Martellus map is important is that there are striking similarities between it and Martin Waldseemuller's famous world map of 1507. And when Martellus's map surfaced, this was one of the conclusions of the two articles I mentioned that historians of cartography wrote about the Martellus map. They noted the very strong similarities between these two maps and speculated uh, that Martellus's map had served as a model for Waldseemuller, uh, but it wasn't pos possible to pursue the matter in detail. Uh, to, to study the similarities between the two maps more closely, precisely because most of the text on Martellus's map had faded to illegibility. We'll say a few words about Martin Waldseemuller's 1507 world map. Uh, we see it here. Uh, like the Martellus map at Yale, it's a wall map. Um, the Martellus map at Yale is a manuscript, whereas Waldseemuller's map is a printed map, printed on 12 sheets, as we see here. And it's famous for uh, its depiction of the New World and specifically uh, its inclusion of the name America uh, on the New World. So this is the first map to assign that name to the New World. So as I said, the dimensions of the two maps are similar. And there are similarities in their layouts. Uh, both cartographers take advantage of the large margins uh, in the lower corners of the maps to include large text blocks there. The depictions of Africa are very similar. This isn't really the strongest evidence of influence because in both cases, the depiction of Africa is based on Ptolemy's geography, which is to say they share a source. But the depictions of East Asia are very strikingly similar. And this is powerful evidence uh, that Martin Waldsmuller, in making his 1507 world map, was depending on Martellus's cartography. And in particular, we can see that Japan is located precisely at the eastern edge of both maps and has the same orientation and size. Again, even though there was very little information about Japan circulating in Europe at this time. As I said, the, the problem with the Martellus map had been that almost all of the text on it had faded to the point of illegibility. So it was difficult to study the map closely and to read what the cartographer was trying to communicate to his audience. So this is Northeastern Asia on the Martellus map in natural light and hardly any text is visible. One can see that there are banners indicating the names of regions, uh, but it's a large map and one would expect there to be descriptive text and it's really not visible. Zooming in on the Northern part of Northeast Asia, this is one of the most legible texts in natural light on the map and it's not very legible at all. One can see that they, there are letters, but trying to string them together into words would be supremely difficult. This is the island of Japan. Um, basically, no text is visible on it. And yet we would expect there to be descriptive text on the island of Japan, not just because the map is large enough to make that possible, but also because Martellus made this manuscript map of Japan and included it in his Insularium or Island Book. Uh, so a book about the islands of the world illustrated with maps. And as we can see, there are descriptive texts on this map of Japan by Martellus. So it would be reasonable to expect 
that he would include descriptive texts on his large world map on Japan. So what is the solution? How might it be possible to read the texts on Martellus's map? Uh, well, in researching them in the matter, it seemed like the best solution was multispectral imaging. And this is a technology that allows one to recover text and images from damaged manuscripts and maps. Um, the basic idea of multispectral imaging is that one takes a series of digital images at specific frequencies of light. And the number of images depends on the project, but it, it might be 12 or 14 or 18. Uh, but let's say for uh, purposes of illustration, it's a dozen images. The specific frequencies of light would range from the ultraviolet, from starting from about 365 nanometers, going through the visible spectra and into the infrared uh, up to perhaps 940 nanometers. Typically, each of those digital images or most of those digital images will reveal something about the object, some part of the text or part of an image. And the idea of multispectral imaging is to combine those dozen images into one in such a way that that one resultant image contains all the information reve revealed by each of those images. So in, in a nutshell, that's what multispectral imaging is. It's a technology that's useful for recovering text from documents that are damaged by fading, which is the case with the Martellus map, water, fire, overpainting, palimpsesting, and wrinkling. And one of the earliest and most famous applications of multispectral imaging to a manuscript was its application to the Archimedes palimpsest, which allowed for the recovery of, uh, of texts by the Greek mathematician Archimedes that had actually been scraped off the parchment and the parchment had been reused as a prayer book. So uh, with the right object, it's a very powerful technology as we'll see. We had some good indications that the Yale Martellus map was a good candidate for multispectral imaging. We go back to Northeastern Asia uh, on the map, again, looking at it here in natural light. I'm now going to switch to uh, an ultraviolet image of this exact same part of the map which we see here. This was a photograph made uh, about the time that the map was discovered. I think it was in the early 1960s. And when I began my research on the map, uh, I requested from the Beinecke Library a scan of their early ultraviolet images of the map. And when I saw this uh, image, I was absolutely enchanted. It was one of the most uh, exciting images of a map I had ever seen. We can see that there is text everywhere on the map. So again, the question is, how can we get at that text? How can we read what the cartographer is trying to communicate to us? Um, we can see the efficacy of ultraviolet light in this pair of images as well. Uh, so we have the natural light uh, image of Southern Africa on the left, the ultraviolet image on the right. And we can see that the ultraviolet image reveals a tremendous amount of the river network here and also the presence of cities that are very difficult to, distingu to distinguish in the natural light image. Because uh, multispectral imaging involves ultraviolet light, the fact that ultraviolet light is helpful in seeing details on the map suggests that multispectral imaging would be useful as well. Another case, this is the southeastern tip of Africa in natural light. Here it is in infrared, and we can see that the, the infrared light is, is quite helpful uh, in seeing the river system and also in seeing the names of the rivers and other details. And again, because multispectral imaging involves infrared light, this was a good sign uh, that this technology would be uh, successful in revealing text on the Martellus map. So I uh, began working with a group called the Lazarus Project, which at the time was at the University of Mississippi, uh, which is now at the University of Rochester, and uh, who are experts in multispectral imaging. They have all of the necessary equipment, uh, and they were very interested in this project. 
we made an application to the National Endowment for uh, the Humanities for funding for the project. We were fortunate enough to receive that grant. And we visited the Beinecke in August of 2014. Here is the team, uh, that's me on the left. Ken Boydston next to me is the CEO of a company called Megavision that makes multispectral imaging equipment. In the middle is Roger Easton of the Rochester Institute of Technology, who was responsible for most of the processing of the images, something we'll talk about shortly. Michael Phelps is the head of the Early Manuscripts Electronic Library. He runs a project in St. Catherine's Monastery on the Sinai Peninsula doing multispectral imaging of their palimpsest manuscripts, a fantastic project. Uh, and on the right is Gregory Hayworth, the leader of the Lazarus project. And it was Gregory uh, who came up with the idea of having a portable system to do multispectral imaging so that the technology could travel to the fragile object. Here is the map outside of a case. Uh, we brought this easel with us. Um, when you're doing multispectral imaging, it's important that the spatial relationship between the lights and camera remain constant, which is to say that they not move at all. And so to image the map, uh, the easel allowed us to move the map both uh, left to right and up and down in front of the camera. Here's another look. Uh, the metal crossbars there are the laser focusing system. So the, the surface of the map is not perfectly flat. So we had to refocus often. Uh, the laser uh, focusing system was very helpful with that. Uh, they're very, very, very low, pay, low power lasers uh, and they did not do any damage to the map. And of course we knew beforehand that they would not do any damage to the map. Another view of some of the equipment. At the top, we have the multispectral LED light source that allows us to shine only the desired frequency on the object, in this case on the map. So which means it's the absolute minimum uh, amount of energy necessary to get the data. Then we have a diffuser between the lights and the map, which ensures that the light uh, arrives on the map e evenly diffused. And then Gregory Hayworth is sitting at a computer there uh, that controls the camera and the lights. So the entire process is run by a computer. All the exposures are controlled by the computer and all the data is recorded on the computer. For the purposes of the project, in order to obtain the desired resolution, we, we divided the map into 55 overlapping tiles for imaging, overlapping so that the resultant images could be stitched together afterwards. We spent 10 days at the Beinecke for this project, uh, most of that in the dark with these uh, various colored lights flashing. Um, seeing this process is fascinating for the first 10 minutes. And after that, it's really uh, not exciting at all. Uh, and one hopes that one's colleagues have some good stories to tell while one is in the darkness um, and the cameras going through its uh, various exposures, and, and, and fortunately, my colleagues did have some good stories to tell, so uh, it was, it was an enjoyable experience. So finally, we arrive at the results, and we'll begin with the text block in the lower right-hand corner of the map. Here it is in natural light. One can see letters, but again, trying to string them together in, into words would be very difficult. Here it is in infrared light. Um, I think it's fair to say that there are a few extra letters are revealed here, but it's really not of much help. Here it is in ultraviolet light. For whatever reason, uh, the ultraviolet was really not very helpful in this case. But here is the multispectral image. All of the text is suddenly and quite easily legible. In the past, Scholars have used both infrared and ultraviolet light to try to read uh, text in damaged manuscripts. Uh, and this sequence shows very clearly just how much more powerful multispectral imaging is in revealing damaged text 
than either of those two types of light by itself. Looking at other parts of the map, here we'll zoom in on the Alps. So this is a natural light image of the Alps. Uh, the, the image is not out of focus. It's really that difficult to see things um, when you look closely at the map. So again, the natural light image and the multispectral image. And we can see that there are place names everywhere. So this, this image surprised me a bit. I didn't expect the place names in Europe to be quite that dense. Looking in Northern Asia, again, the natural light image and the multispectral image. Uh, we, we begin to see at the, at the left here and the right here, some of the descriptive texts that we'll be talking about later. Looking at Japan, again, here it is in natural light. Uh, basically, no text is visible. Here's the multispectral image and the text appears. And zooming in, it looks quite fantastic until one starts trying to transcribe the text. And one quickly realizes that letters are missing. The words were to have or did extend to the Eastern coast of Japan, but that those parts of the words were not legible. So I wrote to Roger who was processing the images and asked if there was anything he could do, if there was another processing technique he could try that would reveal those additional letters. And sure enough, he was able to do that. He was able to reveal those additional letters. And this brings us to the importance of image processing or Roger, can you give it one more try? Uh, we spent 10 days in the dark in the Beinecke imaging the map, gathering the data. Uh, but it's certainly not the case in a project, in a multispectral imaging project, that one takes the images and suddenly all the text appears. It's a question of processing the images. And that is an art, a time consuming art. So after the 10 days in the dark in the Beinecke gathering the data, um, Roger and other colleagues in the Lazarus project spent months processing the images. And this was a collaborative process. So Roger would send me images that he had processed. I would read the text that I could, and I would circle the parts of the images where I still had difficulty um, reading the text and Roger would try a different technique to see what else he could reveal. So we can see just how complicated this got by looking at part of India here. Here again is the natural light image. Here is the multispectral image, which is very helpful. And we can see three texts at the top of this section uh, that were revealed by this multispectral image. But the part I want to look at is here, where we don't see any text, nor do we see text in this processed multispectral image nor in this one, but in this one we do. And it turned out that Martellus wrote texts on the map in different pigments, and those pigments responded differently to light. And what, what you saw here happened very, very frequently in the course of uh, the processing of the images of this map. Uh, I would ask Roger, is there anything you can do to reveal this bit of text here? He would try a different processing technique that, that may or may not have helped with that question I had, but it would reveal text we hadn't realized was on the map elsewhere. And one thing, one aspect of the project that this complicated was uh, there was no one image that revealed all of the text on the map uh, because Martellus was using different pigments in writing the text on the map. Going back to Northeastern Asia, which we've seen a few times now. Here again is the natural light image. Here is a multispectral image. It reveals these two texts quite well, but here it reveals not the text, but only the lines that Martellus drew to guide himself in writing the text. So this is another case where these different texts were written in different pigments. And that is a physical characteristic of the map, the fact that the texts were written in different pigments that one would never guess by looking at the map in natural light as we see here. 
So we were quite successful uh, after months of image processing and, and working on reading the texts uh, in revealing the texts on Martellus's fantastic world map. Uh, I would say we were able to recover more than 90% of the text on the map. What can we do with that? Well, one thing we can do is look at, compare Martellus's map and Waldseemuller's world map and see, are there corresponding texts on the two map? How much, we, we saw that Waldseemuller was making use of Martellus's map, particularly for the uh, contours of Asia. Was he also making use of Martellus as a source for the descriptive texts? Let's have a look. So we'll begin in Northern Africa. Zooming in on this part, we, here we have the natural light image. Basically, there is no visible text. Here is the multispectral image. Now the text is visible. And there is indeed a corresponding text in the same location on Waltzimuller's map. And if we transcribe them, uh, the Latin on both maps, what I've done here is underline the words that are the same. So the words that are not underlined are different. But what we immediately see is that we have largely the same information in the same location on the two maps, which tends to suggest in the strongest possible way that Waldseemuller copied this text, albeit with some minor modifications from Martellus. What does this text mean? It says, here there are great wildernesses in which there are lions and big leopards and many other animals different from ours, different from European animals. Moving a bit to the Southeast in Africa, again, the natural light image, the multispectral image, corresponding text on Waltzimuller's map. Again, underlining the words that are the same, we have essentially the same information in the same location on the two maps. And the text says, the Chersidras or Celidras is born here, a serpent that causes the ground to smoke. Moving out into the Indian Ocean, we have a, a cartouche, a text block on Martellus's map, which the multispectral image helps us read. There is a cartouche in the same location on, well, on Waltzimuller's map. And even the fact that the two cartouches are in the same location on the two maps is very suggestive. But in fact, we can see that uh, not only are the, the two texts in cartouches in the same location in the Indian Ocean, but they are almost identical. There's only one word of difference between them. And the text uh, means, here is seen the orca, a sea monster that is like the sun when it shines, whose form can hardly be described, except that its skin is soft and its body huge. Moving into Northern Asia, again, the natural light image, the multispectral image, and the corresponding part of Altsimuller's map. And in this case, not only is the text in the same, let's say latitude and longitude on the two maps, but it's in between these two mountain ranges. And again, uh, the, we have just one word of difference between these two texts. So same information in the same location. Uh, it's just about certain that Waltzimuller was copying from Martellus. And the text means here there are monsters similar to men, but with ears so large that they cover their whole bodies with them. So these are the famous Panotii, uh, one of the so-called monstrous races of men uh, that goes back to classical antiquity and had a, a continued life, as it were, in uh, the Middle Ages and Renaissance. Moving into Southeast Asia, again, natural light image, multispectral image, the corresponding part of Waltzimuller's map. And we have, once again, the text with just one word of difference. Heek above means here, ibi below means there. But again, the same information in the same location on the two maps. And it says, here there are many animals different from our animals, again, different from European animals. So uh, it seems that Waltzmiller did a lot of copying from Martellus, uh, but I, I want to be very clear that um, Waltzmiller was not simply copying, was not uh, wholesalely uh, copying from Martellus. 
uh, he actually was making very judicious use of this important source. And so now we'll look at some cases that show that, that show that Waltzmuller was not copying everything from Martellus. We saw before that the shape of Northern Africa is very similar on the two maps. Again, that's not strong evidence of influence uh, simply because in both cases, that shape came to a large extent from Ptolemy's geography. But the case is very different with Southern Africa. Uh, we can see that while on Waltzi Miller's map below, the shape of Africa is, is reasonably familiar, uh, whereas the shape of Africa on Martellus's map above is very strange and very different from what we're used to. It's shaped a bit like a human foot pointing to the right. So this shows us immediately that Baltimore was not simply copying from Martellus. Let's look at part of the western coast of Africa, and I choose a part that's a bit to the north of where, that's, where there's that striking difference in the outlines of the two continents, which is to say a part where we might think that Baltimore would copy from Martellus. So here is that part of the coast on Martellus's map. Uh, the place names are not only illegible, they're invisible. Uh, the multispectral image is very helpful in reading them. And here is the corresponding part of Waltzmuller's map. When one compares, well, one can see immediately that there are the place names on Waltzmuller's map on the right are more numerous than those on Martellus's map. And when one goes through and compares them, there's actually no correspondence between them, a, a very, very surprising result. And what this says is that Waltzmuller found a different source for his place names on the west coast of Africa. So again, he was making judicious use of his source, uh, not copying wholesale, Waltzmuller found a more recent source for the place names on the west coast of Africa, and he chose to use that instead of Martellus. Looking at the Arabian Peninsula on the two maps, here's that part of Martellus's map. This is one of the few parts of the map where some place names are, are actually more or less legible in natural light. Uh, the multispectral image is nonetheless very helpful. And here is the corresponding part of Waltzmuller's map. Given that Waltzmuller had uh, a map by Martellus, if not specifically the one uh, that's now at Yale, in his workshop, and given that in both maps there's no new information here, all, everything we see comes from Ptolemy's geography, we might expect that he would have simply copied from Martellus. But that turns out not to be the case. These are the place names in the central part of the peninsula uh, that do appear on Martellus's map, but which do not appear on Waltzmuller's on the right. And these are the place names in the central part of the peninsula on Waltzmuller's map that do not appear on Martellus's. So Waltzmuller made a completely independent selection of place names from Ptolemy's geography for his depiction of the Arabian Peninsula. Looking at the Northern Ocean and the natural light image, multispectral image, corresponding part of Waltzmuller's map. So above we have two cartouches with text in them with an island in between. And below we have one large cartouche and one much smaller island. And it turns out that there's basically no similarity here. The text uh, on Martellus's map comes from Pliny, the Roman encyclopedist, whereas uh, there's no similar island on Waltzmuller's map. And the text comes rather from Pomponius Mela and talks about the navigability of the Northern Ocean. So another case in which Waltzmuller did not follow Martellus. Moving into the Indian Ocean, again, we have a, a cartouche that is basically illegible in natural light. The multispectral image renders it legible. And there is no corresponding text on Waltzmuller's map. Martellus talks about a fish called the narco, 
that makes a uh, fisherman's arm and whole body numb, even through the fishing pole and line. And Valsimiller, for whatever reason, chose not to copy that cartouche onto his map. Finally, looking at the text blocks in the lower left-hand corners of the two maps here, we can see that, that first of all, uh, Walter Miller's text is much longer. And he's actually talking about a different subject. He's talking about the discovery of the new world, uh, which Martellus uh, did not know about, had not occurred evidently when he made his map. Um, but even though Walter Miller is talking about a diff different subject, he still kept his eyes on, on Martellus's map to looking for things that he could use. And he, in fact, he copied that entire last phrase from Martellus. So we see here that he was making judicious use of Martellus's map as a source, copying some things, uh, but not copying others when he had more recent information or had a better source. So a few conclusions. Uh, one of the exciting things about this project was that it has taken this map that for decades was almost unstudiable and made it studyable in all its aspects. So um, the, the river systems, the mountain ranges, the images of cities, um, the texts, of course, the place names, uh, the multispectral images make all of that studyable. And I'll just point out that uh, the, the images of the cities can actually be uh, quite revealing. Uh, I, I don't think it quite appears on this image, but in Southern Africa, there's an image of a city with a cross on it, uh, which is a, a bit of a surprising result. Uh, so even those small iconographic details that are revealed by the multispectral images can be very important. And also another exciting thing about this project for me is that it has enabled at long last a detailed comparison between Martellus's map and Waldseemuller's. And what that allows us to do is see exactly how Waldseemuller made use of this very rich source in making his map. Um, so we saw that he used some aspects of Martellus's map, uh, the outlines of Asia, um, the long descriptive texts, but did not use others, uh, particularly the place names. And what this gives us is some insight into how Walter Miller functioned as a cartographer. It gives us some insight into his workshop practice, which is something that we just can't get from any other source. We don't have his journals or diaries that, or, or any document that tells us about how he made his map but in comparing these two maps, we can get some insights into that process. I will mention that I've been able to uh, write a book about Mar Martellus's map at Yale uh, using the multispectral images. Um, I show the cover here that has the title in case you're, you wanna learn more about Martellus's map, uh, which I hope you do. And that brings us to a close. Thank you very much.